Remember, during normal metabolism, all the cells in the body use oxygen and then produce carbon dioxide. Hello and welcome back to Tala Talks NICU. Pretty much the most common request that we've had is to do videos on gases. So this video is part one in a whole series of videos on gases. So in this one, we're gonna go over four pretty fundamental concepts that you should understand. In the next video, we'll go through six kind of arbitrary numbers, more kind of advanced concepts that you need to know. And then after that, each video will just go over a specific gas that will dissect and kind of go over the details and decide what we can do to the patient to make that gas better. The four facts we'll be covering today are one, just some general information on gases, why we get them and why they're so useful. Two, a measured number, we'll go over the pH, what we want that number to be at and what causes it to kind of go abnormal. Three, the PaCO2 or the amount of carbon dioxide that's dissolved in blood also kind of the normal numbers for newborns. And then lastly, we'll go over the PaO2, which is the dissolved oxygen in blood and it, how that correlates with the oxygen saturation level. Right, so let's start with number one, some general information about blood gases and what information can we get from blood gases? The answer to that is a lot, which is why the blood gas is one of the most common tests that we send on newborns. The word gas, blood gas, is very confusing to a lot of people, especially to parents. The reason why it's called a blood gas is because it measures the amount of gas that's dissolved in blood. So it measures the amount of oxygen and carbon dioxide that are dissolved in blood. Remember that breathing is made up of two components, oxygenation and ventilation. Ventilation is getting rid of the carbon dioxide and oxygenation is getting oxygen into your blood. So basically a blood gas can tell us a lot about your breathing. But not only does a blood gas let us know a lot about the ventilation status of an infant, it can also give us an idea about how much acid buildup there is in the body. And that acid may have nothing to do with the breathing status. So it also gives us a really good idea about what's going on metabolically with the babies. If you remember from the HIE video, we discussed that if a cell in the body lacks oxygen, then to get the energy that it needs, it will start metabolizing anaerobically. And a byproduct of that anaerobic metabolism is lactic acid. So to go back to the example I always use, if you're sprinting really fast and the leg muscles start running out of oxygen, then they will start anaerobically metabolizing and you'll get a buildup of acid in your leg muscles. That is basically when you cramp. If you got a blood gas at exactly the right moment, preferably somewhere near your leg muscles, then that blood gas would show that not only is there less dissolved oxygen in the blood because you ran out of oxygen when you were sprinting, but also metabolically, it would show that there is a buildup of acid. There could be other reasons why a baby may have metabolic acidosis or a buildup of acid in their blood, and they may have nothing to do at all with breathing. For example, an infant could be in renal failure, and so there's a buildup of acid that the body literally can't get rid of. That will show up in the blood gas. Or the baby has sepsis, which is a bad bacterial infection. So during sepsis, as you can probably imagine, each cell, because they're trying to fight the bacteria, starts needing a lot more energy. So even if the baby is continuing to breathe normally and providing a normal amount of oxygen to the cells, that might not be enough oxygen for the cells. So they might start anaerobically metabolizing. And so in sepsis, you might have a buildup of lactic acid, even if the amount of oxygen that's dissolved in blood is completely normal. So already you can see that there's a ton of reasons why a blood gas would be helpful. And it also doesn't take a lot of blood. So between 0.2 and 0.3 mLs in most places will be enough to run a blood gas. So for a tiny amount of blood, we can get a whole bunch of information. Right, so now that we've gone over some kind of general aspects of the blood gases, let's talk about number two, the pH. The pH is a measured number in the blood gas. As you all know, the pH measures the acidity or how much alkali there is in a fluid. 
a normal pH is a pH of 7.4. So at that point, the fluid is completely neutral. If the pH of the fluid is less than 7.4, so 7.3 or 6.9, then that means that the blood is acidotic or that there are more hydrogen ions. If the pH is above 7.4, so 7.45, 7.6, then there are less hydrogen ions and the fluid is more alkalotic. Both respiratory as well as metabolic reasons can cause the pH to go down or up. And we'll go over those in a bit. But for now, I want you to realize that very often in neonates, especially in premature babies, the pH of the blood is usually, even in a normal healthy baby, less than 7.4. And there are two reasons for that. The first is that very often the babies aren't breathing as deeply or they're on a ventilator and we don't want to overventilate them. So they're not generally as good at getting rid of their carbon dioxide. So generally they have a little bit of respiratory acidosis from a slightly higher carbon dioxide in their blood as compared to adults. The second reason is that all babies, especially premature babies, have really immature kidneys, especially the proximal convoluted tubule, the first part of the kidneys. And that part of the kidney is responsible for reabsorbing the bicarbonate. So these babies are really good at dumping the bicarbonate from their kidneys. So obviously if you're dumping the alkali or the base, then what's left in the blood is gonna end up more acidotic. So even though a normal pH is a pH of 7.4, generally in the NICU, we will accept pHs pretty much above 7.2 if the other parameters aren't too crazily off. Right, now the number three number that we're going to discuss is the PaCO2, or the amount of carbon dioxide that's dissolved in blood. A normal PaCO2 is around 40 millimeters of mercury, plus or minus five. So somewhere between 35 and 45 millimeters of mercury. Remember, during normal metabolism, all the cells in the body use oxygen and then produce carbon dioxide. So that carbon dioxide travels back in the blood towards the lungs, and then the lungs are responsible for getting rid of the carbon dioxide how well the lungs get rid of the carbon dioxide is called ventilation. So if there is a higher PaCO2 in blood, so there's a PaCO2 of 50 in the blood, then that means that those lungs are not doing a good enough job of getting rid of the carbon dioxide. So those lungs are under ventilating. If the carbon dioxide level is low in the blood, so a PaCO2 of 30 or 25 or 35, then the lungs are doing an excellent job of getting rid of the carbon dioxide, maybe even too good. And so at that point, if anything, they're overventilating. The next thing you need to understand about the carbon dioxide dissolved in blood is that some of that carbon dioxide will combine with water, so H2O, CO2 plus H2O, and form carbonic acid, which can then break down and give more hydrogen ions. So logically, the more CO2 you have, and there's obviously an endless supply of water, then the more hydrogen ions that you'll have and the more acidosis that you'll have in the blood. So because of that, a high CO2 from respiratory reasons, because of underventilation, will result in increased CO2, increased carbonic acid, increased acidosis. So a high CO2 is considered respiratory acidosis. If the carbon dioxide is low, on the other hand, so you have a PaCO2 of 30, then that shifts the equation the other way and you end up with more free bicarbonate ions. So you end up with a respiratory alkalosis. To reiterate, if you have a PaCO2 above 45, then it is considered a respiratory acidosis. If you have a PaCO2 less than 35, it's considered a respiratory alkalosis. Now let's talk about number four, the PaO2, or the amount of oxygen dissolved in blood. Interestingly, we don't use this number, which by the way is also a measured number, as much as we use the PaCO2, the base deficit, as well as the pH, basically because of two main reasons. The first is that we can get a pretty good idea of oxygenation status from the pulse oximeter. And honestly, if you're getting a blood gas on a kid, most likely they've got a pulse ox on their wrist or their foot or whatever. 
The second reason is that the PaO2 is only reflective of what's going on in the body when you get it from an arterial sample. So if you're getting the oxygen from a venous sample or a capillary sample, it doesn't necessarily reflect exactly how much oxygen there is in the blood because you could have squeezed it out or the cells in that area may have just used a lot of the oxygen if you're getting it from the venous blood. Obviously, if we're really concerned about the oxygenation status, for example, in a persistent pulmonary hypertension newborn or in a critical congenital cyanotic heart disease newborn, then we would be following the PaO2 carefully. That baby would have an arterial line and would be following the PaO2s. Go back and look at the oxygenation index video to see how we kind of use those PaO2s to put them in the OI equation to kind of try to gauge how sick a baby is and whether they need INO or ECMO even. For now, let's talk briefly about the relationship between the PaO2 and oxygen saturations. I feel like this confuses a lot of people, but it's a really very straightforward concept. Remember from the ventilator videos that oxygen is not very soluble in blood, whereas, as you remember, carbon dioxide is very soluble. That's why oxygen needs to be transported on hemoglobin. If there isn't hemoglobin, then you're not going to be able to transport oxygen around the body. In fact, out of all the oxygen in blood, only about 2% of that oxygen is dissolved in the plasma, and the other 98% of it is reversibly bound to the hemoglobin atoms. Each hemoglobin molecule has four places where the oxygen can bind, and they're actually binding to the iron atoms. So each hemoglobin molecule can hold four oxygen molecules. Let's assume we have one molecule of hemoglobin in our body, which obviously is incompatible with survival, but for this example, if you have one molecule of hemoglobin in your body, and let's say out of the four possible binding sites for oxygen, only one of them has an oxygen molecule attached. If you put a pulse ox on that body, then it would show that your oxygen saturation is 25%. Out of all of the possible binding places, only one out of four is taken up with oxygen. So that would be considered 25% oxygen saturation. Logically, if two of those sites were taken, it would be 50%. And if every single iron atom had an oxygen molecule attached to it, so all four had oxygen molecules attached to it, then the baby would be standing at 100%. Obviously, the amount of oxygen bound to the iron atoms, which is what we actually call oxygen saturation, is going to be related to the amount of oxygen that's dissolved in blood, which is the PaO2. So you'd expect that as the PaO2 goes up, even more of that oxygen is bound to the atoms. In fact, that's absolutely true. In fact, the relationship between the PaO2 as well as the oxygen saturations can be plotted out on the oxygen dissociation curve. As you would expect, as the PaO2 gets higher, the oxygen saturation gets higher. The steepest part of the curve is at very low PaO2s. So you can imagine how important that this is clinically. If the baby isn't having a lot of oxygen in its blood, then you would want those hemoglobin molecules to grab onto any possible oxygen atom as much as possible and keep holding onto it. And that's one of the amazing things about the hemoglobin molecules. They can change their affinity to oxygen, depending on different states in the body. As the curve gets higher, it flattens out slightly. So for example, you could have a PaO2 of 95 and have a saturation of 100, or you could have a PaO2 of 360 and have a saturation of 100. This becomes very relevant in diseases like chronic lung disease and ROP, where we're constantly worried about the amount of oxygen exposure to the kids. Obviously, if we have just a pulse ox on and it's always satting 100%, we don't really know whether this baby is getting way too much oxygen or just maybe a little bit too much oxygen. So like I mentioned, depending on the baby's state, it can either hold onto the oxygen more tightly or kind of let go of it more loosely. So the curve's steepness can change if the baby is acidotic or septic or alkalotic or even has a fever. Interestingly, babies also have a different type of hemoglobin from most of the hemoglobin that adults have. So babies have hemoglobin F or fetal hemoglobin. 
fetal hemoglobin has a really high affinity to oxygen, which means that under the same PaO2, the oxygen saturations in fetal hemoglobin will be much higher than the oxygen saturations in adult hemoglobin. So, for example, an adult to get a saturation of about 90% of all the hemoglobin molecules would need a PaO2 of about 90, whereas a preemie who's 29 weeks to get a saturation of about 90 would only need a PaO2 of about 40. So you can see that they have very different oxygen disassociation curves. If you think about it, that's really important, especially in utero really for two reasons. The first one is the baby is not getting a lot of oxygen. It's getting the venous blood from the mother. And so it's not receiving a high oxygen content. And so it needs to grab onto any single oxygen molecule that it can. The second thing is, is that we need the hemoglobin molecules in the baby to have a higher affinity for the oxygen than the mother's hemoglobin molecules so that the oxygen will actually come into the baby's body and stay in the baby's body. So that was the first part of gases. I really hope that you learned something. Hopefully you've really understood the relationship between the PaO2 and the oxygen saturation. And honestly, if you kind of understand those four parameters as well as what oxygenation and ventilation mean, then everything else is going to be a walk in the park. So um, please remember to like and subscribe and also please go and answer the multiple choice questions on the community page. I feel like we hope that they're going to be a really good revision step for you all. Thank you for watching.